Welcome to First Christian Reformed Church of Montreal. This is the online version of our worship service for Sunday, June 6, 2021. If you're joining us for the first time, thank you for being with us. If you'd like to find out more about us at First CRC, you can visit our website at www.montrealcrc.org and you can also visit us on Facebook. Let's begin by coming to God in an opening prayer. O Lord, our God, you are always more ready to give your good gifts to us than we are to seek them. And you are willing to give more than we desire or deserve. Help us so to seek that we may truly find, so to ask that we may joyfully receive so to knock that the door of your mercy may be opened to us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And all God's people said, Amen. We have a couple of suggested songs to share with you as we begin our time of worship together. How great is our God, and great is thy faithfulness. If you look in the description below this video, you'll find links to other YouTube videos that include the words and music for each of these songs. You can also follow many of the songs we sing at First CRC if you have the Lift Up Your Hearts songbook. Our call to worship today is based on Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's, and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it, for he has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully. Our God himself greets us with these words first spoken through the prophet Zephaniah. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Amen. We'll be continuing our series on recommit. This morning we'll be looking at Malachi chapter 3 verses 6 to 18. Before we read these words together, let's again come to God in prayer. God of mercy, you promised never to break your covenant with us. Amid all the changing words of our generation, speak your eternal word that does not change. Enable us to respond to your gracious promises with faithful and obedient lives through our Lord Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Malachi chapter 3, starting at verse 6. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how were we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. You have spoken arrogantly against me, says the Lord. Yet you ask, what have we said against you? You have said it is futile to serve God. 
What do we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly evildoers prosper. And even when they put God to the test, they get away with it. Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other. And the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. On the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. I will spare them just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I should start off by, by pointing out that during the time that I've been a pastor, I've noticed that a couple of things tend to come up whenever you preach on a, on a passage like Malachi chapter 3. Because Malachi talks a lot here about giving, he talks about tithes and offerings, there are times when people will right away assume, oh, must mean the church is behind on its budget. Because that's, that's often how it works, right? Oh, giving is down. Time to get the pastor to preach about giving more again. So in case you're wondering, I don't really know how we're doing on our budget. I assume that we're doing okay. No one's told me otherwise. The other thing that tends to come up when you start looking at a passage like Malachi 3, people people tend to bring up the issue of tithing, of giving 10% of what you get. Are we still supposed to do that? Because Jesus never says that we still have to, but then again, he never says that we don't have to either. And while that is a good question, it can also distract us from what else is going on in passages like this. And that, that actually gets me to the other thing that often happens when you look at passages like Malachi chapter 3. People often assume that what Malachi is saying here, he's, he's just talking about money. How are we using our money, our financial resources? It's, it's kind of like those credit card commercials they used to have that would ask, what's in your wallet? But really... What Malachi is talking about here, it goes beyond money and giving. What Malachi really wants to know is not what's in your wallet, but what's in your heart. Or as another pastor put it, it's not so much what you have, but what has you. And that way, it's important for us to pay attention to what's going on here in Malachi. So, what is really going on here in Malachi? The little book of Malachi comes at the very end of the Old Testament. Malachi himself, he was one of the last prophets of the Old Testament era. He lived about 400 years before the time of Christ. And his ministry took place during a rather difficult time in the history of God's Old Testament people, Israel. The Israelites, they had been back in the Promised Land for about a hundred years. They had spent the previous 70 years in exile in Babylon because they had abandoned God. They had gone after other gods, so God had let their enemies come and take them away. But now, now they had returned. They had rebuilt the city of Jerusalem. They had finally finished rebuilding the temple. But there was still this sense that things weren't back to the way they had been before. The peace and prosperity they had once enjoyed as God's people living in the promised land, it hadn't come back. As Malachi points out in 3 verse 11, things were tough, food was scarce, pests were devouring their crops, the vines in their vineyards were sick, the fruit was falling off before it was ripe. So, like I said, even though the people had returned, 
they still had this sense that God, God hasn't returned to us. Now, according to the law of Moses, God's people were supposed to give a tithe, that is, a tenth from their crops, a tenth from what they earned to the Lord. And what they gave, that was supposed to be used to support the Levites and the priests whom God had set apart to serve him at the temple. So, by not giving their tithes, what the Israelites were doing was, was having a direct impact on their worship. It was having a direct impact on their relationship with God. But given the situation, you can kind of understand why it was easy for them to find reasons to justify why they were holding back from God. But then as Malachi points out in the rest of his book, it wasn't just that the Israelites weren't bringing in their tithes and offerings the way they should. They were also apparently coming to the temple to offer sacrifices, but they weren't bringing in their very best animals. Instead, they were bringing in the ones they didn't really want anyway. And the priests weren't really doing their job. They weren't teaching the people God's law the way they were supposed to. And many of the Israelite men, they were divorcing their wives and marrying other women, foreign women, women who worshipped other gods. So, like I said, you can kind of understand why it was easy for the Israelites to find reasons to justify what they were doing. There was this sense that, well, we're back, we've returned, but where is God? He expects all this from us, but is he really still there for us? How are we supposed to give him all the tithes and offerings he wants when we're dealing with locusts and drought and crop failure? And as Malachi points out in, in 3 verse 15, they even took the argument a step further. What's the point? What's the point of doing what God wants when the arrogant, the people who go around acting like they don't need God, they seem to keep getting ahead? What's the point of doing things God's way when those who don't end up getting rich? It's like the Israelites were saying, God, why should we keep investing in you? when we don't seem to be getting a return on our investment. But then what God says right at the start of this passage, it makes clear the problem, the problem is not that God hadn't been there for his people. God makes it clear, I haven't gone anywhere. I have not changed. But you, you still haven't returned. You may be back in the promised land, but in your hearts, you still haven't really come back to me. And what God says, it makes clear that the issue goes beyond Israel's failure to bring in the tithes and offerings he expected. The problem is that they keep holding out. They keep holding back. They still don't fully trust God. They aren't willing to commit themselves to his care. You look at the, the tone of the conversation that Malachi describes here. Every time God says something, his people right away respond with, What do you mean? What did we do now? And most of them, they just wouldn't listen, even though God is trying to get them to see, to understand. You are, are so obsessed with your stuff. You worry about trying to hang on to what's mine but you are missing out. You are missing out on the blessing of being mine. You're missing out on the blessing that comes from being my treasured possession. Now, like I said before, there are a couple of issues that tend to come up when you tackle a passage like Malachi chapter 3. People assume we're looking at this passage because the church has a giving problem. We must be behind on our budget. But as I said before, as far as I know, we're, we're doing okay. People also assume this passage is all about tithing. Are we still supposed to give 10% or not? Again, Jesus never says that we still have to. But then again, Jesus is also the one who gave himself fully everything he had to God. And we are supposed to be like Jesus. And that, 
that maybe explains this story I came across about this, this new believer and what they did. In this new believer's village, they would draw a circle on the ground and everyone, everyone would put their gifts for the church in that circle. Well, this, this new believer, he had nothing else to give. And so he stepped into the circle. He put himself in that circle. Now that story, I think it gets at what is really going on here in Malachi chapter 3. When it comes to giving... From the Bible's point of view, the question is not what's in your wallet. The question is really what is in your heart. Again, it's not about what you've got, but what has got you. What comes first in your life, God or something else? And so that impulse to do what the Israelites did, to, to hold out on God, to try and hold back from him, it may be understandable, but it is a very real danger, especially when you look at how our situation, it's not all that different from what God's people were facing back in Malachi's time. We maybe haven't been in captivity. We haven't exactly been living in exile. But after almost a year and a half of COVID, it can kind of feel that way. And here in our own church family, most of us, we have been spared a lot of the financial impact of the pandemic. But it's still there. And it could still become an issue as the cost of just about everything seems to keep going up. The pandemic could eventually have an impact on our giving. It could have an impact on our church, but I also think that if we're willing to trust God, he has already provided what we need. There is that one other story about this minister who one Sunday stood up and said to his congregation, I am pleased to be able to tell you that God does have enough money to do all the work that needs to be done for his kingdom. It just happens to still be in your pockets. Again, what God is asking us in Malachi chapter 3, he's asking for more than just what's in our pockets. God is asking if we are willing to give of ourselves. Are we willing, like that new believer did, to put ourselves in the circle? More than money, more than financial contributions, churches, churches need leaders. Churches need volunteers. Churches need people willing to give of themselves, to teach, to mentor, to connect, to care. And I know for myself, that's, that's not always easy. There are times when it can be so tempting to think, you know what? I'm tired. I'm frustrated. There's other stuff I've got to deal with first. And that sense of blah, of, of languishing that we talked about last Sunday, that doesn't help any. And especially when you are part of a smaller church, it's easy to justify feeling that way. Why is it, why is it that it's always the same people doing all the work? And so, it's not hard to find reasons to justify holding back from God. It's not hard to find reasons to justify holding out on Him. It's easy to start thinking, God, aren't I giving enough already? When do I get something in return for everything I've done? But when, when we're at that point, that's where we really need to hear what God is saying in Malachi chapter 3. Again, God reminds his people, hey, I, I haven't gone anywhere. I have not changed. But that also means that I know you. I know what you're like. You are still just like your father Jacob, the schemer. Like him, you still try to hedge your bets. You still try to hold back from me. In their hearts, the Israelites were basically thinking, what, what does God want from us? Why is he always after what's mine? 
But what they need to see, what they needed to understand is, is that what God really wants, what he has always wanted, is to bless them. Test me, God says. Try me. Just trust me. Bring the whole tithe in and see what happens. Stop holding back from me and you will see that I am a God who does not hold back. I will throw open the floodgates of heaven. I will pour out so much blessing you won't know what to do with it all. God makes clear that his desire is to bless, to bless his people. His desire is to give himself to his people so fully and completely the nations will see, the people around you, they will call you blessed. They will get to see what it looks like to live in relationship with the living God. They'll get to see what it really looks like to be God's people, to experience his blessing, to share in his peace, his shalom. That's kind of ironic then that God's people, according to Malachi, they are so concerned, so obsessed with hanging on to what's mine. They're so worried about trying to hang on to what they consider treasure. But what God really wants, his heart's desire, is to have them as his treasure, his treasured possession. And really, really, what's better? What makes more sense, desperately trying to hang on to what's mine? Or getting to hear God say, you are mine. Now, I realize that what I've been saying, it could raise some other concerns. This idea that if we just trust God and do exactly what he says, if we just turn over our tithe, our 10% or whatever, like we're supposed to, then he will cause showers of blessing to come pouring down upon us. Well, that does sound pretty good. Except that it also sounds a lot like what a, a lot of health and wealth preachers try to push. Prosperity theology. Just trust God and he'll make sure everything goes your way. And that may sound good. But it's not quite that simple. Things don't exactly work that way. You look at Jesus you look at God's own son and what happened to him. If, if anyone fully committed themselves to God, Jesus did. If anyone fully entrusted themselves to the Father's care, he did. And yet we're told that during his time on this earth, he had nothing he could call his own. He had no place to lay his head. And in the end, his commitment to doing God's will cost him his life. He ended up giving it all on the cross. Except that it wasn't the end. It was really a new beginning. It was the start of a new creation. And so in Jesus Christ, we see most clearly what we have. We have a God who does not hold back. As Paul says in Romans 8, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Now, what does it look like then to live that way? I, mean, I came across one other story about a man who, who finally returned, who returned to God. But it was after years of alcoholism and his addiction had taken a toll on his family's finances. But then one Sunday after he came to Christ, he was sitting in church with his wife. And what he was hearing, it clicked, it resonated with his heart. And so at the end of the service, he took out his wallet. He wanted to do something, but then realized all he had was $20. It was all he had. And so he looked over at his wife. She nodded and squeezed his hand. It was all right. And so he put the $20 in the collection plate 
but what they both felt, it was like a burden had been lifted from their shoulders. Now, in some ways, I wish that the story had just stopped there, but there is more. Apparently, when they got home, they found an envelope sitting on the kitchen table with enough money in it to cover all their bills. Now, to me, that, that ending kind of spoils the story. Can God do stuff like that? Of course he can. But does he always? What if he chooses not to? But still, the part of the story that got me, this couple, they gave their last $20. They gave their last $20 and left with a sense of God's peace, his presence. And I think what that really is, that is a picture of what Malachi 3 verse 12 is talking about, how the nations will see and call you blessed. This is a picture of, of what God's peace, of what his shalom really looks like. The world tries to tell us that we ought to be more concerned about what have I got. But in his word, God tells us that there is something else that, that matters even more. Who has got me? Amen. As we continue our worship together, let's take a few moments to reflect silently on what it is that God really wants how his desire is to bless us, to have us know that we are his treasured possession. Let's again come to God in prayer. Lord God, Father in heaven, we have again come together as your people to worship you, to praise your name. We are here because we of all people should know how good you are. We are here because we especially should know what it means to have been healed by your hand of mercy. We should know what it means to have been set free by your love. As your people, we can testify that your promises never fail. And yet, Father, we also know that we so often do fail. This past week especially, we have been reminded of how your people can fail in terrible ways. Our hearts go out to the families and communities that are grieving over the discovery of these unmarked graves at the residential school in Kamloops. And as much as, as we may want to, to say that we weren't involved, at least not directly, these things were done by those claiming to act on behalf of the church in the name of Christ. These little ones never got to go home. And their families were, were never told what had happened to them. And while this wrong cannot be undone, Make us willing to commit ourselves to being part of the difficult but important process of seeking truth and reconciliation. Lord, as your people, as those who have experienced your goodness and love, we bring to you those who need your strength, your healing. We bring to you those who grieve. We bring to you those in our church family and community who are recovering from surgery and who are dealing with long-term illness. We bring to you those who are struggling to make ends meet and those who are struggling with difficult relationships. Father, we ask you again to help us commit ourselves, our lives to you. Be with us as we continue to worship you. Go with us into this new week. 
May others see in us something of your love, something of how good you are. In a world where people are so worried all the time about, about trying to hang on to what is mine, help us to be ready to tell others whenever we get the opportunity about what a difference it makes to have a God, the God who made heaven and earth, say that you are mine. We pray all this in Jesus' precious name, in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Giving is part of our worship here at First CRC. It's part of how we show the love of God by reaching out to other people. Now, if you are just joining us online, there's no expectation that you have to give anything. But if you are part of the church family here at first, this is one way that we can give thanks to God and help in the work of his church together. Our offerings this week are for our own ministries here at First CRC and for Mission Montreal. Mission Montreal is a collaborative effort of Resonate Global Missions, Diaconal Ministries Canada, Classes Eastern Canada, Christian Direction, and First CRC of Montreal. Mission Montreal works to reach out to young people and newcomers and to also help provide training opportunities for church leaders called to serve in urban, urban ministries. For more information on how to give, especially if you want to give online, you can contact us by going to our church website or by visiting our Facebook page. God calls us to again live for Him. God of love. As in Jesus Christ, you gave yourself to us. So may we give ourselves to you, living according to your holy will. Keep our feet firmly in the way where Jesus leads us. Help our lips to speak the truth that Christ teaches us. Fill our bodies with the life that is Christ within us. In his holy name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. God, who has given us so much, sends us out to serve him and live for him. And he equips us with his blessing resting upon us. The blessing of God, the giver of every good and perfect gift, and of Christ who summons us to service, and of the Holy Spirit who inspires generosity and love, be with you all. Amen. As our time together comes to an end, we have a couple of more suggested songs to share with you. We are an offering, and may the mind of Christ my Savior. Again, if you look in the description below this video, you'll find other videos, links to other videos with the words and music for each of these songs. Until next time, God bless. <laughs>